My name is Rachel, I'm 23 and I'm from Dublin in Ireland. The other day I was on my way home from work and my route home takes me through a park that I walk through almost every single day. The path I was down cuts through the park diagonally and there are metal benches at certain spots along the path. Then the other day, as I was walking through the park, there was a man sat on one of the benches. He looked like he was just minding his own business. Him being there didn't set off any alarm bells at all. I'm not stupid, and I've been in a handful of situations already where I'd seen a creepy fella hanging about and thought, nah, I think I'll take a cab home tonight. But in this case, I didn't get any of those vibes at all. I walked down the path and he didn't pay me any attention at first, but as I got within a few feet of him, I heard him say something that couldn't have been directed at anyone but me. I didn't hear exactly what he said, but I just ignored him at first. But then as I passed him, I saw him stand up from the bench out of the corner of my eye and I realized he was following me. I took out my earbuds, then as I carried on walking with the man asking, hello, in a really obnoxious way behind me, I set my phone to record a video and then tried my best to record him without him realizing as I carried on walking down the path. He kept asking me, hello, are you deaf or something? Until I had my phone recording and I said, no, I'm not, I just don't want to talk to you. The fellow was easily in his fifties and I realized that he was probably feeling brave on account of the half empty bottle of vodka that he was carrying with him. But as I actually talked to him, it was like talking to a child. I told him I didn't want to talk to him and he asked me, why not? I told him I just didn't and that he shouldn't be following people he doesn't know through parks. He told me there was nothing wrong with walking with someone and that he just wanted to be my friend. He carried on like that, being completely pig-headed and irritating, but he didn't escalate so I just kept on walking until we were only a few feet away from the exit of the park with the street I live on just on the other side. There's a set of those anti-cycle gates near the end so I had to slow my pace a bit to walk through and as I did he asked me, well can I have a hug then instead? And I was like, no you, you bloody well cannot have a hug, are you mental or something? I know it probably wasn't the smartest move to antagonize the guy, but I was furious that he'd have the cheek to ask a stranger that in the first place. I was so outraged that I stopped as I was about halfway through the cycle gate, but I think that's exactly what he wanted. He reached out and grabbed hold of the arm of my coat. I tried to pull away from him and he stepped forward closer to the gate and managed to get a grip of my arm. I remember looking around really fast to see if there was anyone I could call over for help, and when I didn't see anyone, all that anger I felt turned to total fear. I tried to tell him to get off of me, but my voice broke up as I felt a lump forming in my throat. I didn't think I'd get so scared so quickly, and I suppose feeling it hit me all at once was just a little too much. When I pulled my arm away as hard as I could, and I expected him to look angry or something. He didn't. He looked like he was having the time of his life. He had this big grin on his face, like he was loving every second of seeing me so frightened, and that only made me more and more afraid that he was going to do something further. I kept moving through the cycle gate after shouting at him to leave me alone. I didn't look back. I wasn't sure if he was following me or not, but... All I could think to do was keep walking at a brisk pace and hope I ran into someone I could ask to help me. I turned the corner and there was a man in his yard and a half a football pitch down the street tending to his front garden. I just remember power walking towards him, hoping that I wasn't followed and really wishing that I'd chosen some flatter shoes. He saw me before I got close and I'm guessing he could see what a state I was in because he stopped and stared before asking if I was okay as I got closer. I looked behind me one last time and felt this wave of relief as I saw the man who had been following me was gone. I'd somehow managed to keep it together until that moment but when I realized I was safe the dam just burst and I ended up bursting into tears as I asked the gardener man to call the garda which is what we call the police here, by the way. I saw the man again the other day when I was walking home. The guardas said they'd 
given him a talking to about approaching young women when it's unwelcome, but he was sat there in the exact same spot as last time, like he was just waiting for me to walk past again. I walk home a different route now. I'd rather be safe and get home later than risk walking past that bastard again. I just don't understand why men have to be like that. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. I found myself in quite a predicament, owning an apartment but completely broke. Desperate to make some extra cash, I decided to rent out the empty room in my apartment, despite my reservations about sharing my space. I am aware of the unfortunate reality of our world, where crimes are committed for monetary gain and have read about various conspiracies and documentaries that only add to my distrust. However, sometimes you must do what you can to make ends meet, even if it means taking risks. Once I had posted the advertisement, my phone began to ring incessantly with most of the callers being single women looking for a roommate. While I admit I was intrigued by the prospect, I couldn't shake the feeling that the situation could quickly turn into one of those chilling crime documentaries I had watched. And it was not a risk I was willing to take. Despite my best efforts, I had yet to find a suitable roommate among the few men who had expressed interest in sharing an apartment with me. My discerning mind had detected flaws in all of them, leaving me with little hope of finding someone who met my expectations. However, my luck changed when I received a call from my longtime friend Jared. He was in town and needed a temporary place to stay while he searched for his living arrangement. Without hesitation, I offered to share my apartment with him, hoping he would accept. To my great relief, he agreed to my proposal, and I felt a sense of contentment, knowing that I would be living with someone I could trust. He swiftly moved in the following day, and we proceeded with our day-to-day -day routine. He was amiable, never encroaching on my personal affairs, and respected my privacy. However, that was not the end of it. I found his company to be enjoyable and entertaining. We sometimes played games together, which was fun. Hey Jared, I'm off to a party. If someone named Susan rings the bell, don't open the door. I informed him that since he was new. Jared looked perplexed and asked me, who is Susan? Just some psycho girl who lives in the building. I have never met her, but she occasionally rings the bell. I replied while tying my shoelaces. Jared seemed more curious and asked me, why? I took a deep breath before responding. I don't know, but I have heard a conspiracy theory about her from our building security guard that she does illicit behaviors. Therefore, I prefer to avoid any interaction with her. Jared nodded in understanding, but still seemed confused. But why does someone named Susan ring your doorbell? I shrugged and said, That is an excellent question, Jared. Unfortunately, I do not have an answer to that. However, I do not want to waste more time thinking about it. I appreciate your help in keeping our home safe while I'm away. See you later. And with that, I left for the party. While his question was valid, I never tried to ask the girl what she wanted due to my paranoia. I thoroughly enjoyed myself at the party that night and had the pleasure of meeting a stunning Latina woman. We hit it off quite well, and I secured her contact information for future dates. However, after consuming too many drinks, I realized I could not drive and opted for a taxi home. 
As I was wobbling to my apartment, I noticed a girl going downstairs. For some reason, she looked familiar, but I couldn't pinpoint where I had seen her before. I was too drunk to think, so I dragged myself to the apartment gate and unlocked it. As I walked in, I found the lights were off, so I went to turn it on. Just when I took a step after turning the lights on, I stumbled over something and fell. My eyes tried to find the source only to land on the most horrible sight, making me sober immediately. A pool of blood on the floor. And as my eyes trailed the blood, Jared was bleeding and lifeless. I rushed to his side and checked his pulse, but he was dead. There were multiple stab wounds on his body. Someone had brutally done this to him. My mind went to that girl I had seen earlier on the stairs, and I wondered if she had done it. I was panicked and trembling as I dialed 911 and informed them about Jared's body. That girl I was sure I had seen her somewhere. I tried harder to remember where I had seen her, and that was when I remembered the first time a girl rang my doorbell after I heard Susan's conspiracy theory. It was the same girl. Was she Susan? And if she was, then does she murder people too? My body started shaking at the thought of that. I was relieved I had never opened the door for her, but I was terrified by Jared's death. People arrived within half an hour while I was curled up in a corner, shaking from the terror that had taken over my body. They started asking me questions about where I was when this happened, etc., and I told them everything, including the girl I saw on the stairs. I was questioned for hours about everything. It seemed they were suspecting me for murder as well. But after I proved it to them, with the help of the Latina girl I met at the party and the guy who hosted it, I was clear to go. But I was scared to return to that building. So I called my sister and asked if I could stay for a few days and she agreed. She lived a few blocks away so I walked there. I told her my friend was murdered at my apartment, but didn't give her more details. Brother, I'm going to shower. If my friend drops by, please invite her in and give her something to drink from. As she was saying that, her doorbell rang. Never mind, here she is. She went to open the door, and the moment I heard the name Susan from my sister's mouth, I turned to see, and there she was smiling as if nothing had happened. Our eyes met and an eerie smile formed on her lips, sending me chills. I don't think we were safe anymore. My older brother was one of those people who liked to scare me and my other siblings as much as possible. I couldn't really blame him for it because Although I didn't like being scared myself, I was just as guilty as trying to scare our younger brothers and sisters as well. But kids are allowed to be a little hypocritical, aren't we? The thing that always scared me the most was this big old house that my brother and I walked by every day on the way to and from school. The town we lived in didn't have bus service for any of the kids who lived in the town itself, so we had to walk to school. It was a good half an hour walk. The house that my brother always talked about was a really old Victorian that of course looked like it hadn't been kept up in decades. The lawn was completely dead and there was not anything but brown grass. An old dead tree was in the backyard, with a decayed tire swing swaying from it. Old broken bicycles, tricycles, and other contraptions littered the backyard as well. There was an old rusty shed there too. 
There was never a car in the driveway, and we never saw anyone leaving or entering the place. But we knew that someone lived there because if you walked by in the evening, you could see blue light shining from behind the curtains as if somebody was inside watching TV in the dark. Whenever the two of us walked by the house, my brother would always make strange comments about what was going on in there. I had to pretend like it didn't scare me, but I was only 12 years old at the time, and I was quite easily scared. He would tell me the man was a butcher who preyed on the little kids in the neighborhood who were stupid enough to walk up to his front door. My brother said the old man would grab the kid, take them out to his shed, hang them from their feet, and then lightly slice their skin open with a fine knife, and then slowly let them die as the blood trickled out into a tub that was under them. Growing up, every time he was in the mood to do it, my brother would dare me to go to the guy's door and break one of the old pots on it. I always declined because I told him I didn't want to get in trouble. He would then make fun of me for being a scaredy cat and taunt me for hours. On Halloween, the year that I turned 12, rather than going trick-or-treating, I was invited to hang out with my brother and his friends. They were doing what we at the time considered mature things. We egged some houses. We lit a flaming bag or two. It was a fun night. Late in the night, my brother and his friends decided to haze the new guy, being me. They dared me to go up to the old Victorian house and break one of the pots on the porch. As much as I wanted to be accepted by my brother and his friends, I did not want to do that. And they taunted me for it. And it was humiliating. But my fear was much stronger than the humiliation, and I continued to refuse to do it. When the taunting got really bad, I angrily blurted out to my brother, Well, if you're so brave, why don't you go do it? My brother hadn't expected that, and it worked perfectly because one of his buddies immediately turned to him and asked him that as well. Suddenly, all the attention was off of me, and it was turned to my brother. He was really taken off guard by the development. Still, my brother had to prove that he had the guts to do it. It was one thing for his little brother to be taunted, but he knew he could never live it down. So, acting all brave, although I could tell he was really scared, my brother walked up to the porch of the old building. You could tell he was scared out of his mind, but he didn't let it show. When he got up the steps, he grabbed an old flower pot and pulled it over his head. As he held the pot above him, proud of himself for what he was doing, I saw the door open behind him. A huge man walked up behind him as he was about to throw the pot. His buddy started screaming at my brother, telling him there was someone behind him. He just looked at us all like he didn't believe us. He just thought that they were trying to scare him. As he dropped the pot on the ground and it shattered, though, the guy grabbed my brother around the neck and held him there. My brother's chicken friends all ran off immediately. I couldn't do that, though. My brother had just been grabbed by a lunatic. I ran up to them before the guy could pull my brother into the house and tried to pull my brother away. The man swatted at me several times. He was huge, and he was choking the life out of my brother. Not knowing what else to do, 
I realized I had to take the cheapest shot possible. It was the only way I could help my brother. I kicked the guy square in the crotch. He groaned in shock, but he didn't let go of my brother. So I kicked him again. And again. I kicked this huge man a total of six times before he finally let go of my brother. Although my brother was wheezing and struggling to breathe, I knew we had to get away from the recently sterilized psychopath and I pulled him away. It was difficult, but we were able to get out of his yard and down the street before he was able to do anything. Our parents called the police, but get this, they wouldn't do anything about it. My brother was not only trespassing, but he vandalized the guy's porch. We were all shocked and my parents were outraged, but the police did absolutely nothing. This man got away with it. Now, I'm the first one to admit what my brother did was wrong, but the guy was strangling him. Afterwards, my parents drove my brother and I to and from school every day. They figured it was best to avoid the guy as much as possible. The one good thing that came out of this was my brother had a lot more respect for me. It was at least two months before he began ragging on me again. But that's how brothers are. I never thought that I'd have anything to post on the subreddit, but here we go. This literally just happened, so I had to try to keep this as short and as organized as possible. My 29-year-old female and my partner is a 23-year-old female. We were back in her own town visiting her family for about a week. It's a very small, isolated town in the middle of nowhere, and basically in the middle of the woods. While we were here, she wanted to meet up with an old high school friend who still lives in the area. We'll call him Kyle. So we meet Kyle at the beach, and right away he's acting super weird, making jokes about a three-way with us and just making a bunch of just unwelcome, gross comments. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent, but coming from someone who is supposed to be her good friend, it was extra annoying. So my girlfriend and I are shooting each other panic looks the whole time. Once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry. That he's never been like this before. And we can make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him we want to get dinner at a local bar. But he just asked to join us. We felt awkward. So we end up saying yes. He says he doesn't know quite how to get there. So he follows us. We get their order drinks and food, then head out to the patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but it's generally been way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. We're smoking some weed on the patio and chilling. The food comes quick and we finish it quicker. Now, here's where it gets really messed up. So halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired. Which makes sense, as we've had a long day. I give my girlfriend the signal that I want to go. She makes an excuse that we need to go. He keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got some good weed and dives there and you can meet my cats, blah blah blah. He's being really pushy. We keep saying no and making excuses. We need to check on her grandpa, etc. So finally we get in the car and say goodnight. We park next to each other and walk up and into the cars together while saying our goodbyes. And we get into the car. My girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar, but fake it like we're leaving because she doesn't want to chill with him anymore, understandably. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do. He says GPS has been kind of funny and we can lead him to the main road. To be fair, we're in the middle of nowhere, 
so this didn't seem too outlandish. So, obviously, staying behind at the bar was out of the question. So in the car, we were talking about how pushy was being, and she admitted she feels weird driving right back to her grandpa's house. So we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind this for a long time, even way after he should have gotten off on his exit. We think it's weird, but we weren't sure what to do. So finally, we get on a two-lane road, and he pulls up next to us, and he's waving a phone, which is clearly my girlfriend's phone in the window. We pull over, he gives her the phone back, chats for just a few seconds, then leaves in a hurry. Here is the part that makes my skin crawl. We know we had her phone. I saw her put it in her fanny pack, which was on the table, along with my phone in her butt. A few minutes before we left the bar as we were preparing to leave, she didn't take it back out. There's literally no way she could have left at the bar. More importantly, he got in his car and left the bar at the same time as us, meaning he had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. It's not like we left the bars first and he saw it left on the table or something. He literally handled it and walked into the cars with us and calmly said goodnight with the phone already in his possession. Now, the kicker, Apparently unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend had tasted a very weird bitter taste in her straw at the bar and was already suspicious, especially with how he's been acting. This is why she wanted to stay back at the bar, to get away from him and stay in public where she felt it was safer. So when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she kept for protection in her jacket. I didn't know at the time that she had done this. So that's why he had left so quickly. Obviously, I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicions sooner. But she just didn't want me to panic. I'm really shaken up. A few things are clear. One, he stole my girlfriend's phone. And it seems like he did so so that he would be forced to pull over on a dark road in the middle of nowhere till he quickly ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed her knife. They'd been good friends for almost 10 years. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious, I feel like he would have acted confused about the knife or said something like, what's up? Why would you flash a knife at me? Is this as some sort of bad movie or something? But instead, he just booked it. Which tells me he knew exactly what she was doing reacting to a threat, and preparing to protect herself and me. And three, he probably spiked our drinks. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I finished half my drink, and I felt relatively tired. A few more things. I just don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us noticing or knowing it doesn't really make any sense. But he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting it in her fanny pack perfectly. We almost had no idea how he could have spiked our drinks unless he was working with the bartender. But we were the ones who suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it. But I think I know why. And for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex-friend who made creepy comments, probably tried to drug us and stole her phone in order to get us alone the dark road. Please keep your distance.